I was really expecting something much worse because I, I thought you were going to go in like a collection of black holes. That, that's just my weekend, you know? <laughs> See, that's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> Joining us this week is a stand up writer, actor, and co host of the podcast Urgent Care. Please welcome Joel Kim Booster. Joel, it's good to Hello. see you. Let's get into it. What a week. On Tuesday, a jury in Minnesota convicted Derek Chauvin of all three charges stemming from the murder of George Floyd. The verdict was a tremendous relief to those who feared that even in a case as egregious and awful as this one, there would be no accountability. But that is not how Lachlan Murdoch's in-house white supremacist Tucker Carlson reacted when he seems to have accidentally booked a guest who was willing to criticize Chauvin's conduct. I, I just think that... It was excessive, yeah, and well, it shouldn't happen. And, and what I'd like the, to say, the guy who did it looks like he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. So I'm kind of more worried about the rest of the country, which, thanks to police inaction, in case you haven't noticed, is like boarded up. <laughs> so that's more my concern. But, but I appreciate you coming let, on, Ed Gavin. Thank let, you. Let, nope. Done. Thank you. That laugh is the last thing you hear before you find out Batman has to decide whether or not to save <laughs> you or Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. I mean, what a fucking baby. S such a man child. And he, the, the thing is, is, you know, Tucker Carlson doesn't even have to be doing this to himself. You know that, right? Like, he's independently wealthy. The man could just fade away into obscurity he, with, and not have to worry about any of this. And yet here he is on our TV screens laughing like the Joker. People do strange things when they start moving up the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know? Like, he has a lot. He has a lot of his needs met. And for whatever reason, for now almost four decades, he has taken on whatever persona is needed to be central to the kind of right wing conversation. Yeah. He was he started out as a kind of semi serious, semi serious writer uh, from a conservative point of view. He goes on to become this like bow tie wearing fuck uh, uh, CNN pundit. He then becomes a right wing troll with the Daily Caller, and now we have this lady. He was on Dancing with the Fucking Stars. My name is Tucker Carlson, I'm a journalist. And then now he has his final form. This is his final Pokemon form of revanchist right-wing nationalist, uh -huh. yeah. Did you see his um, yearbook page circulating earlier this week? Yes, yes, let's talk about it. Let's talk about him being a part of the Dan White Society? I, um, so. <laughs> what? <laughs> For those uh, who haven't followed this story, um, like the broken people that we are, uh, there, Tucker Carlson went on his show and said, there's some lunatic from the Washington Post trying to do a hit job on me, but don't worry about it. It's not real. <laughs> it's like, which is really not what you do if it's not real. And then it turns out that in Tucker Carlson's yearbook, it says, uh, uh, he was part of the Dan White Society, and I'm sure, Joel, you had the same reaction as me, which is, it can't mean that Dan White. The Dan yeah. White that <laughs> fucking shot Harvey Milk. <laughs> like, like, that can't, there must be another Dan White. But who, who is it? Who is the other Dan White? It has to be. It's, it, it seems like it's that Dan White, because I think that's how, because I, I believe it's like roughly a few years after uh, right. that he is in college. And part of the Dan White Society, again, the man who shot Harvey Milk. And Mayor uh, Muscone. And, let's not forget. and Mayor Muscone. Let's not, lest we forget, making Dianne Feinstein the mayor, acting mayor. Um, really jumpstarting her career. By the way, Dan White is responsible for the current incarnation of <laughs> Dianne Feinstein as we know it. She was about to go and eat, pray, love herself out of politics before this happened. And then this moment changed the entire trajectory of her career we we only have diane feinstein misremembering names and quotes um in uh <laughs> today because of dan white so but yeah no like uh, it seems like he meant because i looked i was like there is there some other dan white there's no other dan white certainly not in whatever year that is 1987 they know what dan white you're talking about yeah. so that really sucks i'll just say that that sucks in other right-wing news, Florida's new anti-protest law, which Governor Ron DeSantis signed on Monday, provides greater civil protection to people who run over protesters with their cars. So I hope everybody's ready for flat boy summer. 
<laughs> no, no, John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Well, see, in Florida, see what's got people get run over right, uh, right, by right wing right. people. Yeah. They'll be flat. Uh huh. And they'll and be Chad flat Hayes, boys. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They'll be flat boys. So it's a flat got boy it. summer. Got it. Got Chad it. Hayes. Yeah. He said the other thing, but this is right. flat boy summer. Mm-hmm. Different thing. Mm-hmm. It's anybody uh, I, can be a part of Flatboy Summer. I, I can't just, wait for you to have to go back through and scrub this reference um, from your I know. Fuck. from your podcast. <laughs> I just want everyone to understand that that's a that's we're gonna call that you know it's dark, all right. Um, macabre. It's macabre. Yeah, it's gallows humor, as mm-hmm. they say. Um, still allowed. Still allowed. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's such a uh, it's such conservative theater. This this bill because. Half the shit that they are touting that it makes it illegal to to like loot basically, and it's like, babe, it's been illegal. We've been we've been new that that half that shit that you're saying is 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 uh, going to be illegal is already illegal. Um, rioting is already illegal. Um, like what 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 exact other than the the flattening part of this, I I don't see uh, exactly what this is doing for anybody. Uh, well, I mean, I do think it's telling people that uh, if they're if they can decide if they think that they can say later that they were scared that they don't have to worry right. about a civil suit if they ram some fucking protesters with their cars. So I think that's that's new. That'll be yeah. that'll that's new. Meanwhile, the Senate passed an anti-Asian hate crimes bill sponsored by Hawaii's Senator Maisie Hirono by a vote of ninety-four to one. Uh, Joel, who do you think voted no? Which one of the Senate's three biggest assholes was it? Tom <sighs> Cotton, Ted Cruz, or Josh Hawley? Mm, I'm going to say this seems like a Holly move to me. It was. You got it. Yeah. You got it. It was Josh Holly. It could have been any of them, but it was yeah. Josh Holly. Uh, when asked why he voted no, Holly said, Well, my political instincts tell me that there is little to be gained in supporting even popular bipartisan bills when I can signal to the base of the Republican Party that I'm unwavering around matters central to white identity politics. And that's because my goal, ostensibly, to improve the country through conservative policymaking is really about attaining power and ultimately the presidency. Why do I want to be president? Well, that's complicated. It's a mix of narcissism from the recognition I received throughout my young life for genuine talent mixed with some innate lack of self-worth I've never really surmounted, combined with a primal ambition, a desire for more that I can put into different pursuits, but it's ultimately insatiable. And then, of course, there's this unexamined fear of death. And the presidency is a means to in some way live forever rather than face the grim reality of the fact that one day I will die. So that's why I voted no. Fear of death. Wow. He fit that all in in just a, a quick soundbite. What a, yeah, what a, a quick, talent! Quick little. He's very. Ta- he is talented. That's what yeah. makes him so troubling. You know, he's he's not as dumb as Trump. That makes Mm-mm. very alarming. Um, almost handsome. Yeah, almost. I was about. I didn't want to say it, John. I, know I you didn't. didn't. I saw it in your face. I saw it in your. You face. saw the little twinkle in my eye when you said "not like, as dumb as Trump," and I said, "But definitely hotter. Definitely yeah, hotter than I Trump. Mean, um, Easier I, to look like. Trump looks like his own Madame Tussauds statue is melting." <laughs> Yeah, it looks like, oh, no, uh, something happened on the interstate. It got <laughs> hot in there. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, Josh Hawley. It's a shame. It's a shame yeah. we could get it done, you know? Also this week, the House passed a bill to make D.C. the 51st state. It now heads to the Senate, where we can either reform the filibuster and pass it with 50 Democratic votes, or we can call upon some sort of divine entity with the power to persuade 10 Republican senators to support increasing the Democratic majority in the Senate while admitting a state to the union in which almost half of the population and a plurality of the electorate is black. But does such a force of nature exist? Tom Carper, senator of Delaware and someone who is currently on track to lose a primary to Dan Pfeiffer, if Tom doesn't come, doesn't get right on the filibuster, has called upon former Connecticut senator and permanent health care monster Joe Lieberman to persuade undecided Democrats and Republicans on the issue. Joe Lieberman's coming to the rescue. He's going to be a little suicide squad. You know, <laughs> if you want to if you want to catch a moderate, you got to learn to think like a moderate. What does a moderate eat? What does a moderate do? You have to have somebody who can help you if you want to catch them. Yeah, it just. It is amazing to me that like even even you hear even some Democrats say that you sort of uh, waffle on this and be like, is it fair? Is it fair to add to, to give ourselves a supermajority with the state? And it's like, bitch, why do you think there are two Dakotas? OK, like why they, they they've been doing this. Like, it's it's so frustrating to be on the one side that gives a shit about rules, you know, like, yeah. And and just completely imaginary rules, by the way. There's nothing. There's this is very air bud. There's nothing in the playbook that says we can't give ourselves a supermajority by doing the right thing and making DC a state. Like, just get on board. Well, it's just like 
these are the rules. They're right there. Yeah. These are these are this is a, this is a state. We have Wyoming. Nobody in Wyoming, you know. DC be a state no different than Wyoming. They try to come up with every argument against it. They can't do it. I think we should basically be going further and letting DC statehood be like the compromise positions. Like my view, here are some future states. We should give Puerto Rico the option if they want to be a state, let them decide. Mm-hmm. Uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. I don't mind it. I think it's time. Let's let them in. You know, Guam and the Northern Mariana Mariana Islands. They're far away, <laughs> but so is Alaska. So is Hawaii. Yeah. Although I though I do believe I think there there are some Republicans in the Northern Mariana Islands, if I remember correctly. Don't don't. I'm not. They're not on my list yet. I don't know. I want to want to find out what's going on over there. It sounds. Well, part of my brain is thinking that there there are Republicans over there. I'm gonna have think? to trust you on that one. I also think we have to get to 52 pretty quickly because 51 is a rough number for stars. You know, it's like yeah, nine, eight, nine, eight, nine, eight, nine, mm-hmm. eight. I don't love that. I don't love Aesthetically, that. Aesthetically, though, I mean, maybe it's time to get rid of the stars. Maybe it's a time for a you total take, overhaul. Come on. I think our ta- our flag is so tacky, John. I no, think it's so tacky. I like it. I yeah, like it. Really? I do. Really? I do. The stars and the stripes together? Well, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, they're they're kind of – um they're – yeah, no, I see the issue. I guess you could make a choice. I, I, th- I think that maybe one way to go is to use the stars to make a shape. You know, it was kind of fun in the beginning yeah. when they were in a little circle. Uh-huh. Maybe they can make a make something, you know? I prefer that, for sure. You know, What like, would it just be? Miss, just a, like, a gun? A gun. I think yeah. it should be a gun. Maybe mm-hmm. that'll get them on board. Hey, it's a gun. <laughs> it's, a, it's a gun, and it's... Um, it's a gun and a woman forced to carry a baby to term <laughs> oh, no. against her will. But all is not in the hands of Connecticut's most annoying person who doesn't work in finance. On Thursday, protesters headed to the marina to protest in front of Joe Manchin's houseboat. Joe Manchin, this is real, Joel. When he is in D.C., lives in a houseboat called Almost Heaven. No. As though I thought he couldn't yeah. get any worse. I thought the man could not no, be it's any more obnoxious. Before we look, we can we can talk about the houseboat. I will say, and we were very critical of Joe Manchin on this program, but if you're going to be a senator from West Virginia that lives on a houseboat, calling it almost heaven's pretty great. It's yeah, pretty. Good I mean, it's at the very least it's on brand. Um, it's great. You yeah, got it. you got to assume the water pressure on this boat uh, is terrible. And I'm wondering if he wouldn't be a little less obstinate on some key bills if he wasn't always in a bad mood from taking subpar boat showers, you know? Yeah. Those aren't going to have good pressure. No, not at all. Not at all. He's not. He's definitely not clean. He's no. not getting himself clean. Well, and I'm in a grumpy mood when I'm not clean. Right. For sure. Right. It's like he's it's it's like go. Oh, it's like why I don't go to Burning Man. No and, water pressure. Yeah. And it's like. And, and also, like, not just – it's also a job where you wear a suit every day. Mm. And, like, if you ever put on a suit when you're not feeling – you got to shower before you put on that suit, you know? It's tough. It's tough. In other news this week, Doug Emhoff, the nation's first second gentleman, uh, is doing a light brand refresh. He now says that uh, the Doug Emhoff persona is a bit limiting. And from now on, he's asked to be known as second gentleman Chris Gaines. Uh, it's a- <laughs> That's a deep cut. It's a deep cut. Yeah. But in reality, uh, according to like what was actually a pretty flimsy political story, but whatever, uh, Doug is wants to go by Douglas. He's going back to Douglas uh, in his official capacity, no longer Doug. And I think it's nice. I think it reflects like the deeper and broader aspects of what what is contained within Doug slash Douglas. Emhoff, Doug has a past. Douglas sure. exists in the here and now. But I mean, that's a move you that's you're allowed to do that when you go to college. And then the the name you choose for yourself in college, that is the name that you are going to be na- known for for the rest of your life. You, that's the one place you get to pivot. Not when I, you become the second gentleman. OK, but you there's a girl in, I went to college with who decided she wanted to be named Honey. And guess what? She regrets it now, but she's still Honey to this day. She there is no turning back. I think that's right. I do think you get one chance. Like, I think that there was this, you know, 14 month window where I could be Jonathan, Mm -hmm. uh, but I missed it. But that said, you know, I do think that like when you become the first second gentleman, you get one chance to try on a new personality. Yeah. And I guess it is like going to college. (laughs) It's it's like going to college. Like 
Doug is a mild-mannered Jewish lawyer from Brooklyn. He is a supportive, loyal spouse. But Douglas is a pansexual post-Christian hedonist <laughs> who took mescaline the night of the inauguration. He wandered to the National Mall and he said to Abraham Lincoln, with whom he had a full conversation, once America is comfortable with a second gentleman, maybe we can introduce a third gentleman. <laughs> you know, that's, that's Douglas. That's not Doug, that's Douglas. On Wednesday, Republican Senator Rand Paul uh, had this suggestion for, for President Joe Biden. But there is no evidence of that. If you want more people to get vaccinated, Joe Biden should go on national TV, take his mask off and burn it, light a torch to it and burn his mask and say, I've had the vaccine. I am now safe from this plague. If you'll get the vaccine, you can be safe too. Very, very like evangelical theater. Like, I get where he's coming from. Like, this is like youth group, like me burning my Avril Lavigne CDs at a bonfire at Bible camp. Like, that's the vibe that he's bringing to the vaccination question. Well, the thing about it, though, is I'm not a doctor. Rand Paul's a doctor, but a bad doctor. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like, I do think that, like, I don't know how you're feeling about this now, but like there's been a bunch of stories about how we ro probably don't need to be wearing masks outside. Mm -hmm. And now when I walk the dog with this dog right here uh, in the morning, I feel like I have two settings, which is like mask on and silly and mask off and guilty. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? It's like, I know I, I want to do the right thing, but I also like I'm alone on the street, but oh, there's somebody coming and somebody passing me. So my thing is like, if like Rand Paul wants people to get vaccinated, which is better than a lot of them. Uh, and like, I do think if we're going to have a situation, I kind of think they need to tell us we don't need to wear the mask outside unless we're in a crowd anymore. Like, give us that. Like, we need a win here. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's the thing. Like, you know, the, the beginning of this pandemic, it was people like you and me saying, trust the science, trust the science, trust the science. And now the science is telling us we don't need to wear masks outside if we're alone walking our dogs in the morning outside of our beautiful homes in West Hollywood or wherever you live. And, you know, it's time to tr trust the science still, you know? Yeah. And I just think they need to like, if, if what we have learned is that like outdoor transmission is pretty hard, is not really possible when you're just randomly walking by somebody, maybe in like a really compact crowd, you should think about it. Then they should give, they should like, we can't have a situation where we're supposed to be kind of wearing them all the time because it's safer to have people wearing them indoors and knowing that they're effective and then taking them off when they get outside than some of the people wearing it some of the time in both places. Yeah. And I just like- So what you're I, saying is you agree with Rand Paul a little bit. I, like, a t I obviously don't think Joe Biden should burn his mask. I don't think that sends the right message about wildfire season, about <laughs> science. But I do think, like, one lesson, I, and like, I, and not just people like people like Rand Paul, you can put them aside, but like people like Zainab Tufeci have been talking about this, that like, there's a lack of honesty about people's behavior and some of these recommendations. Like, I want, like, we should obviously the science should guide what we do. The evidence should guide what we do. But the recommendations, the goal of the recommendations are not to make the most strident recommendations based on the evidence. It's to release recommendations that have the best possible impact mm -hmm. and protect the most people. And to me, those are recommendations that reflect that people are people and they want to go outside and they want to see friends. And like, if you don't give them those ways of doing it, they'll do what happened over the past year, which is say, fuck you and travel for all the holidays and do everything else. So it just feels like a year into this pandemic, over a year now into this pandemic, almost a year and a half into this pandemic, they're still not letting, they're still like making recommendations as if human beings aren't human yeah. beings. And I hate that Rand Paul is who made me say that. And finally, the discovery of dozens of black holes clustered around the center of a nearby group of stars has astronomers scrambling to determine the official collective noun for a collection of black holes. This is going to be brutal. This is just going to be brutal. All right, just brace, <laughs> brace for this one. Here we go. A group that's impossibly dense and reduces everything it touches to pure nothingness. We should call it Congress. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I was really expecting something much worse with that preamble, honestly. But, well, thank um, you. Because I, I thought you were going to go and like, 
a collection of black holes. That, that's just my weekend, you know? <laughs> See, that's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> collection of black holes wow the pandemic really is over <laughs> that kind of thing yeah you know? exactly. that area that's that would have been better that's better mm-hmm. that's a good pitch mm-hmm.